Hello, I'm Father Giles. I'm a monk, a Benedictine monk, from Pluscombe Abbey in Scotland. And I've been asked to talk to you about Advent. What's Advent about? Well, the name Advent, the word Advent, means coming. Someone or something is coming. Now, if you know something is coming or someone is coming, you watch out for them. So, one aspect of Advent is watching. St. Peter says, doesn't he, in his letter, be sober and watchful. And being watchful is one of the old monastic watchwords, yes, watchwords, for an awake Christian life. Be sober and watchful. Don't go to sleep. Remember the gospel about the ten virgins, bridesmaids, with their oil and without, they all went to sleep. And then, suddenly in the middle of the night, came a shout, The bridegroom's here! Wake up! And they woke up. They weren't quite ready for his coming. He came at a time that was unexpected. And that's one of the things our Lord often tells us in the Gospel, isn't it? That he will come at a time when no one expects. If you knew when the thief was going to come, you'd have been waiting and you would have chased him away. He comes in the middle of the night unexpectedly. And that's true of our Lord. After all, we're celebrating the coming, the advent, of a baby. Now, all right, you can say, well, nine months, so it should be this date. But babies are not born wearing watches. And inside their mothers, there is no clock ticking away. Sometimes babies come early, even very early. Sometimes they come late. They come when they want to. They come when it's convenient to them. How many parents have been caught out by the unexpected arrival time of the baby. They are born in all sorts of places, not in the places that people expect them to be. When is our Lord going to come at the end of the world? We don't know. And again, he warned us to stay awake 
on watch. Because when people say, oh, he's over there. No, he's not. When they say, oh, he's come. No, he hasn't. And think of all these rather strange sects of various kinds that say, the last day will happen on such and such a date, at such and such a time. And the day comes, the time comes, and nothing happens. So God is unpredictable. And in our own lives, when he comes into our lives, he can come in all sorts of ways. His providence. It can be someone we meet who is Christ. A poor man, a sick person, whom our Lord says, Yes, I am that poor person. I am that person you did or you didn't give some clothing to when they were naked. You didn't expect me. But there I was. Jesus comes to us in all sorts of small ways and big ways. He will come to us in a big way when he calls us to himself at the end of our lives. And again, we don't know when that will be. Am I going to live to be a hundred? Well, possible. I don't really expect it. Ninety? Well, my mother lived into her nineties. Eighty? Well, lots of people make it to eighty now. Seventy? I'm past that. But when? When? I don't know. So I have got to be watchful. Because when he comes, I have to go. I can't say, oh, do you mind, Lord, I've got to finish this. Or I want to get that done. He says, no, I've come for you now. And in some cultures, when someone dies, they bury them with food for the journey and maybe paper money and, and all sorts of things like that. But when our Lord comes, well, St. Paul said, you came into the world naked. Little babies are not wearing any clothes. And when you die, you leave this world naked, not necessarily not wearing clothes, but not able to take anything with you. As they say, there are no pockets in a shroud. So, being watchful, being sober, not falling asleep, not, now if you're not sober, if you're drunk, then you're not in touch with reality. What's going on around me? Can I see the signs of the times? Am I listening to what the scriptures say? What Pope Francis says? Are we in an end time now? I don't know. Nor do you. Only God knows. But we can behave as though it was going to happen tomorrow. We can have, as it were, our bags packed, ready for the journey, have everything in order. You know, they're always telling you, have you written a will? What will happen when you die? Will your poor family have a very complicated 
situation to sort out because you weren't prepared. You didn't make any effort. Well, what about a much more important journey? Are we ready to meet our Lord? Are we ready to respond to him? If you're waiting, well, everything is ready and to hand. I've got my passport, I've got my money, my case is down there. The dog's been lent to someone else. I've given my phone numbers to people. Someone else has got the keys of the house. Everything is ready. So as soon as someone says, come, I can say, right, fine, shut the door, that's it. But what about our Lord? Can I do that with him? Am I awake and watchful? The old monks had a word for this watchfulness. They called it nepsis. Because we're, we're always in Advent. What's the last verse in the Bible? Can you remember? It's a prayer. It's, Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. So, we're still asking Jesus to come. That's a very good prayer to pray. When my mother was getting old, she was nearly a hundred when she died, I encouraged her to pray that prayer a lot. Because when you're old, you want to go to heaven. When she was in hospital, I said, where do you want to be? And she said, I want to be safe in the loving arms of Jesus. But Jesus has to come and get you. You can't go on your own. So, come Lord Jesus. But that's not just for me only. Because the whole world needs Jesus. It needs evangelization. Nobody will be happy unless we have Jesus. Jesus is the answer to all our desires. If we have Jesus, we don't need anything else. Come, Lord Jesus. And then when we look round at our world, there is war, there is famine, the sickness, especially now. There are so many problems, difficulties, sufferings. And the answer to them all is Jesus, the Prince of Peace, who went around healing people. You look in Matthew's Gospel, and anybody who comes to him, he heals them. He doesn't say, excuse me, I have done enough healings for today, I am going home. He heals everyone. He doesn't say, oh, this is too complicated for me. Or, you're not good enough. They come to him, he heals them. And evil, well, that's why when you baptize a baby, the first thing you do is exorcise it. Say, devil, go to hell. Get out of here. Jesus came and drove out the devil and devils all over the place through the power of evil. The starving. Well, how many times did he feed 
thousands of people and lots left over. Yes, we need Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Thy kingdom come. We pray that in the Our Father, don't we? Thy kingdom come. He came to proclaim the kingdom, the kingdom of the Father. He came to bring us back to the Father. So, come Lord Jesus. But we also pray every Mass, asking Jesus to come. Remember, we say, awaiting the blessed hope and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, just before communion, just when he is coming to us in the Eucharist, every time, every Mass. So it's important. It's not just for four weeks at Christmas. Awaiting the blessed hope and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now the word that is translated there as coming, all things, a little quotation from St. Paul's letter to Titus. And there he says, the coming. But the word coming is not advent, it's epiphany. Now, epiphany? Well, like lots of words in the Bible, it's got a lot of history behind it. It's not as simple as it looks. Because an epiphany is a manifestation. So when we have the actual feast of the epiphany, it's Jesus making himself manifest at Cana when he performs his first miracle. When he's baptized in the Jordan, and God says, this is my beloved son. And what we think of, first of all, at the Epiphany, when those three kings come and say, this is the man. This is the one we've been looking for. So an Epiphany. But that's not the whole story. An Epiphany is like a state visit from the emperor. So, what happens when, suppose, President Biden comes to visit Singapore? What will you do? Well, there'll be a big parade, and uh, the big wigs will go and visit, meet him at the airplane, and uh, there'll be a guard of honour to inspect, and there'll be lots of flags flying, and maybe the children will get a holiday from school, and a firework display, and, and all sorts of things to say welcome, to do honour. But when he comes, he's got to show something in return. And that was the way it was with the Roman emperors and so on. What they did was what they called philanthropy, which literally means love of men. So you build, you open a new hospital or do some kind and generous acts. And so when you know the emperor is coming, it's going to be, you're going to enjoy it. And there are benefits for you. It's not just he, he blows in and has, a, has a, a meal and then blows out again. So we're awaiting the advent, the epiphany of our Lord Jesus Christ, our great saviour, our Lord Jesus Christ. Every Mass, we are being reminded about this. So, instead of just whistling past and not paying much attention, we have got to think. We are being invited to look forward to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. When he came the first time, how many people knew about it? Well, I suppose Herod and his advisers knew because the, the wise men turned up and said, where's the king of the Jews? 
Though most people know. The people in charge of the inn. Well, they didn't know this was Jesus. This was true God and true man. Or they would have said, oh, empty the best room and give them a really nice ensuite room, you know, with everything warm and comfortable and we'll make sure they're, they're well fed and all the rest of it. Now, nah, no room at the inn. So they have to go to the stable. The shepherds knew about it. Imagine if you were a shepherd, a man looking after sheep. Well, you're not the best known person in the world. You're out there on the hills with some sheep and some dogs because you don't want anything to attack your sheep. And dogs can hear things and smell things and see things especially in the dark, much better than you and I. And they are capable of chasing after wild animals that might want to eat the sheep, or thieves, equally. And so there are the shepherds. I wonder what they were doing, whether they were just chatting. They might have been saying psalms, like King David. After all, he was a shepherd, and when he was out looking after his sheep, he was making up psalms, praying psalms. Maybe they were doing that. But they weren't expecting anything special. And then suddenly, boom! What happens? You see all these angels up in heaven, singing glory to God, peace to men of goodwill. That was not part of what they expected. A complete mind-blowing experience. Because Jesus was born. Well, who was Jesus? They didn't know. But they said, well, if the angels are going to get involved, it, it's important. And if it's just close by, then let's go and find out. Because if you go to the Holy Land, Bethlehem is not very far from Jerusalem. If you go up on the Mount of Olives and look, you can see the hills above Bethlehem. It's not far away. And if you get to Bethlehem, then you go off, let me think, a little to the east, towards in the direction of Mar Sabbath, and there is the, the place which they say are the shepherd's fields, not far away at all. So they didn't have to go a long way. I wonder if they took their sheep with them when they were coming. I don't know. But they certainly decided to go and look. And when they got there, the, the end of Advent, what had come? There was a, a young woman. She was probably an early, in her teens at most. And St. Joseph, who was probably a bit older. And a baby. Now, a baby can't do anything for itself. It can't feed itself. It can't wipe its bottom or change its nappy. All it can do is lie there and scream if it wants to have its nappy changed or to be fed or to be cuddled or whatever. A baby is really helpless. And a baby is small too. Nowadays, with better food and so on, babies are often quite big. But if you go somewhere where people are poor, then babies are only the size of a child's doll. When I was in Africa, the medical mission sisters, they would have five babies in one incubator, which in a first world country would have one baby, because the babies were so small. So you can expect Jesus was a very small baby. And 
this, this baby who had been inside Mary, contained in the womb of a young woman, was someone whom the whole world cannot contain, because God is much, much bigger than the whole universe. So those shepherds, they looked at this little baby. He didn't look like God. But then those angels had said, hey, that's what you're going to. It must have been the same for Mary when she was preparing for him. A little baby in her tummy, bouncing around, because babies need to bounce around to develop their muscles. If they're too premature, they haven't had time to do that, and then you have to give them physio to make them strong. A little baby. A baby whom she loved, but a baby just the same. Her first and only baby. Now, yes, she trusted God. She knew that he was in charge. But nonetheless, she must have wondered, you know, I've never, I've never fed a baby. I don't know what it's like. How do I, how do I look after him? How often do I have to feed him? How can I keep him warm? I don't want to drop him. All the things, all the worries of a new mother. And, well, she wasn't at home with her, her own mother or her mother-in-law to say, this is how you do it. She was out in this, out in this cold stable with the warmth of the breath of the animals to keep her baby warm. 